Hi there. Uh, they say that size doesn't matter, and if you've seen me rushing around the garden getting excited about these uh, little uh, uh, FM transmitters that I've been building, so I've been getting excited about uh, a couple of hundred milliwatts um, working over uh, 30 or 40 <laughs> feet. And uh, I just wanted to set the record straight and uh, give you some notion of things that I've been involved with in the past, so there's things that involve a bit, a bit more power and uh, things that involve a bit more distance. Um, so uh, this, this is uh, a little bit about me rambling on. Um, thank you to everybody that responded to uh, the previous video where I asked um, if you were happy with long or short videos and it seems as though the consensus so far anyway is that you're happy to <laughs> hear me rambling on. So this is essentially about me rambling on and just sharing with you some of the things that I've done um, uh, in, in my working life and in my uh, hobbies. Um, so uh, I'm not quite sure which direction it's going to go in yet but um, anyway uh, I hope you find it interesting. Sorry about the wind noise. I'm trying to address the uh, sound problems that I have, but I've uh, I brought you outside because the sun's shining, and um, I have got a microphone with a little windshield on. But um, uh, we'll see how effective uh, that is. It's uh, it's reasonably windy today. Again, not a howling gale, um, but. Uh, Anyway, um, sit back and enjoy it, I hope. First, I'll talk a little bit about distance. Um, and uh, when I first got involved with um, amateur radio, uh, I set up a radio station after passing my uh, license. I had to get a, an A license, or I wanted. Uh, an A license because that was the best license that I could get but of course I had to learn Morse code uh, and that was particularly difficult for me because I knew I would never send a note of Morse code because uh, I'm dyslexic and I don't think anybody could read dyslexic Morse code um, and it took me 18 months to actually learn the code um, and uh, I got to the stage where I could read and send 20 words a minute. Um, and I actually failed my first test because uh, when they sent the, uh, the code uh, at 12 words a minute, I simply couldn't copy it. And uh, a good friend of mine, uh, John G4PDQ, who would uh, give me a lot of help, said, uh, go away, don't, don't listen to any code, don't practice any more Morse code, um, give it a month and reset your test. And I did that and I passed the test um, the second time without any problems. But uh, I'd, I'd literally overdone it. I could copy commercial traffic and uh, had a lot of fun uh, that I, I enjoyed that. But uh, I haven't used it for so long I've, I've forgotten the, the code now. And um, I, I wanted the A license because um, that allowed me to get on to uh, call it the big boys bands. And um, uh, as I say, I, I actually passed and I received my license on the um, uh, 12th of July 1988. And I spent the day uh, powering up my transmitter. I lived in Cheltenham at that time. and. Uh, there's uh, the GCHQ, uh, they call it the secret spy centre, but the GCHQ, uh, General Communications Headquarters, and uh, I always thought it wasn't a good idea to start transmitting um, without a licence. So as soon as I got the licence, um, I, I spent uh, the day setting up uh, the station, and then on the, the 13th of July I had uh, a couple of QSOs, um, but uh, nothing uh, um, much uh, just into uh, America which uh, seemed um, uh, easy uh, but on the um, 
the 13th of July I made my first contact uh, with Australia and um, just to put it in context uh, I was in the UK there and uh, the, the contact was with VK2 uh, VK2 DLB uh, so Victor Kilo to Delta Lima Bravo and that was my first uh, what I call long distance contact and um, normally you, people are familiar with maps like this this is uh, a, a great circle map and uh, this is centered on the UK so believe it or not the UK is in there let me zoom in a bit well I'll zoom in so there's the UK uh, in the middle there um, so uh, uh, this is uh, America over here uh, North and South America uh, Africa so uh, on a great circle map Australia is over here that's New Zealand believe it or not it gets stretched out like that um, simply because if it was a bit further away it would actually go all the way round uh, so that's um, uh, Sydney is where VK2 uh, uh, DLB uh, was situated um, so for me that was reasonably uh, as far as I was going to get so this is my uh, first uh, VK uh, so I was very pleased with that and say so that's two days after I got my license and uh, on the flip side there uh, is saying uh, glad to uh, be your first VK Andy good luck 73's uh, see you again Ben um, so uh, that, that's uh, uh, that one will always be special so I don't know if Ben's still uh, about um, I'm not very active on uh, ham radio um, at the moment um, but uh, it, it is nice to make these long distance calls so I say when you see me getting excited <laughs> going 30 foot across the garden um, just you know uh, uh, th there is um, uh, other strings to my bow shall we say this is a photograph of uh, what my shack was like uh, back in 1988 and uh, uh, this is an old um, FT 101 which is a beautiful receiver uh, in there but a uh, transmitter receiver uh, but an absolutely uh, beautiful receiver everything was very clear uh, I like that a lot uh, what's just out of shot here and uh, which I'm disappointed about um, this is a linear amplifier that I built and um, uh, I'm sure that uh, any amateurs uh, will you know they're always pleased for their first other side of the world contact and uh, as I say I got mine within a couple of days of opening the station and uh, it probably largely to do with this uh, linear amplifier um, but because of what I did for a living uh, at that time I had uh, probably a little bit of an advantage but um, I've got a, a recording of um, uh, one I made uh, probably a year or so ago of a, um, a VK station so if essentially a station the other side of the world to where I am uh, I'm living in Wales now uh, not in England um, but um, um, I'll see if I can find that uh, little video clip and uh, stick it in here. These are some QSL cards. Um, I'm sure most uh, amateurs have boxes full of these things, and um, 
uh, Sophie stuck these in here for me as uh, uh, they're in no particular order but I think she just got uh, a handful and, and stuck them in a, a, a book for me uh, but, um, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of lovely contacts and um, uh, a lot of these conversations I can uh, I can remember having uh, with people and uh, it's rather nice oh my call sign um, when I was first licensed was uh, um, G0JXM that's uh, uh, Germany Zero, Japan X-Ray, Mexico. But uh, as I've moved to Wales, my call sign has uh, changed to Golf Whiskey Zero, Japan X-Ray, Mexico. Um, I don't have a QSL card now, but um, that's um, uh, that's my call there. Uh, GW Zero, JXM. Um, Anyway, as I say, um, I had a little bit of an advantage uh, when I first started off because uh, I was using some fairly large oscillator valves in my day-to-day uh, -day work. I was uh, designing and uh, manufacturing uh, radio frequency induction heaters and uh, that's a picture of me in, uh, in black and white in about 1988 and uh, that photograph was taken by a friend of mine, uh, Morris G3XKD, and uh, that was at the uh, at CARA, the Cheltenham Amateur Radio Association, and I was giving them a talk about um, uh, water-cooled triodes, and um, that's a, a, an oscillator valve. I think that's that might be a 50 kilowatt. Uh, that's a ceramic valve. I'm picking it up by the filament leads and uh, this is a ceramic capacitor um, probably good for 20,000 volts uh, there and um, you can see the water fittings on the bottom of the valve are uh, probably something like one inch uh, pipe fittings so uh, I'll, I'll give you some uh, specifications of uh, valves when I say as a radio ham I had an advantage um, I was building equipment like this in fact this is the largest uh, equipment or the highest power equipment uh, that I personally designed and uh, manufactured and uh, this is a 150 kilowatt induction heater and if you look at it, it looks pretty much like a, uh, a radio transmitter or uh, at least a, um, uh, an old-fashioned radio transmitter. And uh, the big linear amplifiers look like this. So um, this would be a very big linear amplifier. So I say, I had a, a bit of an advantage as I was able to use components from uh, redundant uh, induction heaters. Um, and um, to give you some idea with this, these are three valves, they're three uh, water-cooled triodes and um, so the water-cooled oscillator valves and the HT power supply which is the other side, oh by the way this is uh, from top to bottom is um, uh, about uh, six foot three or something like that so uh, getting on for two meters so the, these valves are fairly large um, but the power supply which is in the other side of the cubicle the HT transformer would be uh, about the size of a small car and uh, the specification for, for this particular machine I remember it very well so it was an oil filled water cooled transformer and you got a three phase input uh, 415 volts uh, star connected uh, primary, um, no big pardon, delta primary, uh, star secondary and uh, the secondary was specified to give 8kV at 30 amps DC from a three phase bridge so uh, what we used to do was actually uh, put the onus of getting the voltage right uh, on the transformer manufacturer, uh, we would actually specify that we want.